Even when I return to my mother's house now, I often remember as a child thinking, who can tell what really goes on behind anyone's four walls? Those painted doors and manicured lawns, do they really tell the truth? Each one of us has a story. I think it's a matter of who wants to remember or who would rather forget. Sometimes it's too late, or maybe, just maybe, it's not. Dear Sodom, I'm dedicating these few words from my heart. Uh, you should remember when, when you will come certain age, in long hours, you can sit down and listen to Grandma's words. Dear Lidochka, the bullets are flying left and right of me. If I don't make it home, please stay by Albert's side and live well. Your caller. Yesterday I received a telegram from Kolya. He's asking that I send him a sweater, but I cannot send it because they do not accept packages at the post office. I thought, where is Kolya? Maybe you're freezing, maybe you're hungry. My dear man, will I ever see you again? I remember 1972 so vividly. My friends and I in the street, playing stickball. Which end of the stick to hold? Who could hit the ball the farthest, the highest? How many sewer caps is a measurement? Using rocks to draw bases in the hot tar pavement. Like everyone in Brooklyn my age, we imagine stepping up to the plate and hitting a home run, or of pitching, striking out the side. But my reality was much different. Wait till your father comes home. I hate it here! Those moments I spent running to my grandmother's house gave me the confidence that there was someone to back me up, someone to support me. Those hours what we sit few minutes together and we share open heart. This this is like the best medicine in my life because I didn't never have somebody should from my relatives listen my, my pain. The black and white photos my grandmother would show me, I'd never forget. The hardened appearances the snowy scenes, the winter coats, not a smile on anyone's face. No one waiting for the perfect photo of everyone smiling. It looked like everything they experienced was visible in their faces, but were they? I'll never forget the one photo of a man in a military uniform when I was seven. Somehow his photo really stood out to me. The age of the man would make him a contemporary at the time of my grandfather Noel. Only thing was, I remember he didn't remotely resemble Noel. Grandma's house, and I would say to her, I would go there, and she would show me the photos. I think I came back, and I, I think you might have said, "Leave me alone." You know what I say? Yeah. Then, <laughs> you, well, you know, you know that, and I would probably do that. Did I say that? 
I recall retrieving letters from my grandmother's mailbox as a child. I always noticed the letters marked CCCP, Russia, or then the Soviet Union. I recount sitting with my grandmother as she opened the letters. She always started to cry as she read them. Who were these people she was corresponding with and with such emotion and pain? Why were they writing and what about? Clearly, it was something of great emotional significance, but something that I was yet to fully know or understand. In school, at the height of the Cold War, we were taught that Russia was our enemy. It was a race to space, the Vietnam War, and the threat of nuclear attack. Could my grandmother have been an enemy based solely on political ideology? Could my father have buried his emotional attachments to his Russian ancestry due to the Cold War? In reality, I was seeing that the policies and ideologies of both countries were not able to distance the hearts and relationships my grandmother shared with her family. In 1972, my grandmother made a very important decision in her life. She returned back to Russia with my grandfather to meet her family for the first time since 1944. I think my grandmother knew she wasn't going to change foreign policy nor melt the Cold War between both countries, but at least for this visit she'd be able to push aside the Iron Curtain and open her broken heart that was sealed for nearly 30 years, where she left so many unsettled pains and heartaches behind. and one she'd never be able to figure out for herself. Her sister Eula, her sister Valentina, and her nieces and their children greeted her in Yalta. For the first time since she departed, she could now communicate face to face, heart to heart, rather than sharing all her thoughts and feelings in a letter. I can only imagine the memories and emotions that the trip evoked in my grandmother's heart. My grandmother born Lydia Alekshevna Sankina in the Koma Republic, some 800 miles north of Moscow. She had a taste of what was to come when a local woman told her as a child that life would bring her to a foreign land. She spoke of the long cold winters, the vast amounts of snow, as the youngest child sleeping on the wood stove to endure the cold winter nights. Stalin embedded in my grandmother's mind from her years in the pioneer. The bright summer white nights, dancing to the bayan with her friends, meeting the love of her life at 16, and walking hand in hand by the river Sicilia. Her sisters Eula, Valentina, and brother Peter, her father, Alexei, a carpenter, seamstress, fisherman, and filled with wisdom, warm-hearted, playing songs for the neighboring prison camp, whose prisoners listened to the records from his gramophone through their wooden camp gates, building their large Russian home and having to share it as a school. Years later, moving it down the Sicilia River by barge to Siktiv Kar. My grandmother loved her father. Her mother, Anastasia, keeping the family protected, praying to the hidden icons in the cupboard when religion was outwardly banned. 
My grandmother studied in a medical school as a midwife, delivering babies in the village of Majado, marrying at 18 in 1938 and giving birth to my father the following year. Her husband teaching in the local school, she attending medical conferences, and he sent for military training soon thereafter. Going off in those days to add entries into her teenage diary, filled with love, hope, and despair. Her heart quivering with every stroke of her pen. War would break out a year later, and war would change her world forever. Nikolai Vinkentovich Turobanov, my biological grandfather. His memory subtly returning, the faded glimpses of him in those old photo albums. As a seven-year-old, everything made an impression on me. Born in 1916 in the village of Koigorodok, three hours south of the capital of Siktivkar. As a boy, scarred deeply witnessing his father's murder for hiding Bali from officials. My grandmother spoke of his softness and sensitive nature. A teacher in various villages of Vocha, Vizhinga, and Majada of the subjects biology and botany from the years 1936 to 1940. Marrying my grandmother in 1938 and then becoming a father in 1939, life looked promising until the following year, on February 4th, 1940, when he was called to military service and replaced from his teaching position. Who could imagine oneself holding a textbook one year in front of young students, returning home to his wife and child, and then having to leave for military training? preparing to sacrifice his young life for his motherland, and years to come stand opposite the invading enemy. Now we are waiting for our assignment from Moscow. For now I'm living well, my health is good. We are in charge of military school, a new offensive. Well, that's about it. I kiss you forever, your Kolya. Well, then I am again with my dear Kolya. We are happy again. We talked a lot together, embraced, kissed. I did not see the days and nights as they passed by. I stayed until June 1st, 1941. It was so much fun for me, joyous in those few days. Is it possible that this would be the last time that Kolya and I would make love? On June 22nd, 1941, Germany would break their 10-year peace agreement unexpectedly and attack Russia. On February 1st, 1942, as a junior political officer and member of a special unit of the 224th Ski Regiment, my grandfather was sent to the front. Работа политработника заключалась в поднятии морально-психологического состояния солдат. Вот это. Они были всегда впереди. Когда они проходили, они хотели. Пехота, держись! During the coldest winters on record, under windy conditions, skiing long distances, no protection from the elements, and operating behind enemy lines. эти лыжные батальоны. Они проходили быстро через наши позиции и уходили в тыл. Они воевали в тылу. Ну да, у немцев в тылу. Но судя по их интенсивности боевых действий, они вполне нормально, так сказать, делали условия для наступающей пехоты, облегчали. Там за каждым камнем, за каждым кустом мог быть и снайперы, и солдаты и так далее. Although athletic and well-trained and feared by the German soldier and known as the White Terror, most would never make it back. From February 8th onward, 43 ski battalion soldiers from the 224th Ski Division were killed or went missing, most likely ambushed in the Yushovsky region. Вот. Там было все написано, все данные. Фамилии, имя, отчество, год рождения, кто остался, дети, жена. Ну, все, что там был, 
Вот в этой ленточке вмещалась, она завинчивалась, и так, в годы войны гимнастерки имели потайной карман. То есть один сверху, а второй изнутри. И там он застегивался. И иначе как ты узнаешь? Ведь пехота на спай упал где-то, я знаю, то ли тяжело ранен, то ли убит. Но вслед за наступающими всегда ходила похоронная команда. Они подбирали убитых. Вглядываясь назад, как ты считаешь, вот битва под Москвой, это была самая такая тяжелая, страшная или нет? Это не то слово. Это была мясорубка. Понимаете, подмосковные поля были усеяны трупами. Мой дедушка, который был политическим офицером, возможно, вероятно, вел свои трупы в бой, умер в феврале 1942, в возрасте 25. Его история, история и память были потеряны где-то в этом снежном, бледном ландшафте войны. Как они героически воевали. Поэтому и сегодня надо о них рассказывать. И сегодня должны знать дети, внуки, правнуки и все те, кто, кто воевал, они должны остаться в памяти навсегда. All that was left were the words my grandmother continued to write in her diary. I waited every day for a letter from Kolya, but it didn't come. Maybe he is no longer alive. Who knows? Death certificate. Your husband, junior political officer, Turubanov Nikolai Vikentievich, born in Komi SSR, in Sisolsky region, village Gurgaon. In defense of our socialist motherland, true to his military oath, I will never forget this day. Showing heroism and bravery, this day will remain historic and a tragic day for me. Was killed in the battle near the village of Palatka on the 8th of February 1942. Today I learned that I am a widow. Is buried in Smolensky region, in the village of Palatka. Dear Kole, you have left me behind. You have died and you are gone. The two of us, Albert, your son, and I remain. You were without happiness from birth, and you to have left your son behind. You yourself grew up without a father and now leave your son in the same way. The most dear person has been torn out of my heart. Germany and the Soviet Union signed the treaty in August of 1939 part of which they agreed that they would not go to war with one another for 10 years. Germany would be allowed to invade Poland and in its aftermath divide Poland essentially in half, the western side to Germany and the eastern side to the Soviets. During the invasion on September 1939 when Germany marched in, many of Poland's Jews knew of the anti-Semitism escalating in Germany. Fearing for their futures, they would try to escape to the Russian side. Noel Galicki, my grandfather, the only grandfather that I actually knew, turned out to be my step-grandfather. Born in Sedlich, Poland, in 1913, a shoemaker, the Polish Jews were flourishing, and life seemed promising and secure until Germany attacked on September 1st. Noel, his wife Henya, and brothers and other family members escaped to brest now occupied by the Soviets. The Polish Jews that remained behind were eventually rounded up into ghettos and sent to concentration camps and faced certain death in the Holocaust. But they told, they told us that the Germans, the, that they found the Germans and the Germans was burning the Jews. And they told us the crematories with, the, uh, with all those things. Yes, yes, we heard about it. We did hear about it, but nobody believed it. On June of 1940, the Soviets sent Noel and his family north to the Komi Republic. Uh, and the train, we laid on the floor. There was no nothing. 
was just on the floor. Some, we had blankets, I had a pillow, maybe I had a pillow, maybe not. My mother, she grabbed a pillow, maybe she had a blanket, I don't know exactly. But we laid all on the train for one month, more than a month, from uh, Poland to, uh, to Siberia. There was no bathroom, there was no food, there was no nothing, nothing. When the train stopped, we used to go down, we used to go under the train, we made women, men, you, there was no different. There was no different. Noel's wife, Henya, would perish due to malnutrition, and their child, Paja, would die a month later. Devastated and alone with his brother and their family, Noel was sent into the woods to cut timber to receive rations for food. A work camp was set up for Polish refugees where he lived, in the village of Majada. Where were they taking you? To the woods, down there, to barracks. That's where those barracks were? Yeah, some so, of them. Oh, those so barracks. Explain the barracks to me, what it was like. What's the matter? It was from boards, windows, all the glass was broken out. We were told that the fascist Hitler had attacked our country, declaring war. Well, that's it. I will not see my dear Kolya. When he's at the front, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, let them defend and let them strangle those fascist vermin. By the river, with the barracks where they were already on uh, one of the st on, on one of the poles were uh, loudspeaker, and they six o'clock they had the news every day. What did it say that day? They said that the war started between Germany and Russia. Now the Russians let you go out from the woods, and they say you have two choices. Wherever you want to go, you want to go to the city, to Siktivka, you could go to Siktivka. If you want to go to Tashkent, you could travel, but you're going to have trouble. In 1943, Noel would meet my widowed grandmother and my father. A year later, my Uncle Paul was born. Mama and Papa have been with me for the last two days. I am going to a faraway place, the Kuban. The steamship has cast off and left my mama and papa behind. In uh, 1945 uh, came, uh, uh, came a Polish, a Polish uh, general and he made peace with uh, Russia. And naturally he told, he told them the, when, we'll, uh, when you'll free, free Poland, Poland will become communism and going to be exact like here in Russia. So they agreed, and then they made up that they're going to send back all the people from Poland back to, to, the, to, the, to Poland. And that time they came and they gave us food, a lot of food they gave us on the train, uh, like, like a big bag of food for each person. And we, and we went on the train, we went for one month from Russia to Poland. Well, now we are in Gladsk, Poland. My country is far behind. It seems that I have died forever. Only my body is still walking about. I went to the cemetery where there are Russian Red Army soldiers. I cried every day on their graves. What kind of life awaits me? Uh, but we thought that we'd come back to Poland like Poland it was before. But it didn't, wasn't that way. It was entirely different. We heard the, the, uh, the Polacks killed the Jews, and the Germans killed the Jews, and everybody else killed the Jews. We heard it. But other countries was different. Other countries, they saved the Jews. So uh, we didn't want to stay in Poland. And we came to Poland, and we stayed there a few months, and then we left. And we heard the, the communism going to come, and we're going to have votes, and the communism going to win. And we left right away. With the help of a secret Jewish organization known as the Braka, they were snuck out of Poland to the displaced persons camps in uh, Germany. The displaced persons camps were set up for, 
former Eastern European refugees who survived the war in various countries, specifically Russia and, uh, and the outlying regions of Russia, and for former uh, inmates of the Nazi concentration camps who had survived the war. In total, there were about 850,000 refugees looking for places to, to, to settle in. Um, the American government, as well as the French and British, set up various places for these people to return. So we had food and we had everything. We had just like the soldiers, everything you wanted, chocolate they gave us, and they cooked for us and they did everything for us. The displaced persons camp that my grandparents wound up in was in Ulm, which was in southern Germany. Um, and in Ulm, they wound up in a place called the Sedenkasern. The Sedenkasern were a bunch of old German barracks that were now being occupied by these refugees and survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, my grandparents and their friends and other family members wound up here, and eventually they would wind up in a place across the street from the, the, the Kasern itself. There was a gate here, and those people stand here in front. There was a stair, and they looked down here to these houses. I met up with my friend Christoph Vanica, a researcher and local historian of the displaced persons camps, and he showed me around and took me to various places and described what it was like in the area when the displaced people were, were there. And in 1945, it was um, in the autumn, that uh, the people complained that uh, those camps were just like concentration camps without gas campers and without uh, execution committees. And so uh, they, they ordered um, Earl Harrison to make a study about the DP camps and he found out it was really very terrific. And only to this intervention of the Earl Harrison, um, it was a so-called Harrison report, the situation in the DP camps changed in October, November 1945. The Jews were being more ostracized even further because they had a nice place to live in the Sedan Caserta. There was a large conflict about space and flats in Ulm between the DPs and the German people. The German in Ulm had the plight to uh, give space to refugees from the east, to, to German refugees. So a lot of houses were jammed and full of people. And then they said, look at the Jews, look at those DPs. They live in the barracks, they have good places, and they are just foreigners. And the German people you have to suffer such, an, uh, such hardships. But on the other hand, who was guilty for the bombings and who was guilty for the war, they forgot the reasons of all this destruction and of all this demolition. Christoph would show me around the, the city itself to the places that replicated the, the, the spots that my grandmother was with her friends, where she would walk around and where she would roam. But they, they are still the same, even the color and in everything, they're not re uh, restored. And so they look very much the same as they looked like in 1945, 46. I remember my grandmother showing me these photos as they sat at a kitchen table. And now I was in this place where I could exactly see where they sat and where they walked. They remained in Ulm from 1946 to about 1949, three years. And then in 1949, they were displaced again to a camp south of Ulm, which was called uh, Fehrenwald, which was in Rulfutshausen, um, a little tiny village that was surrounded by the woods. And um, that was usually the last stop for many of the displaced persons before they would come to America. Ich kann's so schlecht erklären. Ja, 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 ja. Es ist eine, ist eine Umgebung. Es sind kleine Straßen. Ob sie da durchfahren können, weiß ich nicht. Also, es ist nicht mehr viel zu no, sehen. Das weiß ich nur, aber das wollte ich nur aufnehmen, mit einem Videokamera zu zeigen, ja, wo... Ich, ich denke, Sie müssten mal dann das Auto abstellen und es ist nicht so weit. Hier ist die Bettinger Straße. Bettinger Straße. Und da vielleicht das Auto mal abstellen und ein bisschen rumlaufen. Danke, mach ich. kann ich Ihnen leider nicht sagen. Danke, danke sehr. Bitte. Und die Häuser hier, hatten die gewohnt in diesem Häuser? Wir haben alle da früher sind die Häuser alle gewohnt. Nur die Häuser hier? Ja, ganz, ganz Waldraum, überall. Andere Seite, nicht bloß da. Das sind die, die lebt all over here. My father had here gewohnt. He was from Russland. They brought us to a village called Ferenwald. It is boring after the noisy city of Ulm. Nothing interesting in this village. 
boredom no matter where you look, only the memory of Ulm. I don't know how will we live here. Life in the displaced persons camp in Fehrenwald, uh, as opposed to Ulm, seemed a little bit different to my, for my grandma that she once wrote. Fehrenwald itself was a little village that was renamed uh, with the streets of the American states. My grandparents lived on the Missouri Street 12. Oh, here's the 12. Look, 10 and 12. As I returned back to this village, I was walking through the streets looking around at the, the houses and trying to envision what it was like back in 1949. Um, and I caught up with a few of the people who lived in the village who spoke to me about the former life of, uh, of how the Jews lived and what it was like in that village at the time. I saw the old uh, movie theater, the movie theater which my grandmother would watch movies when my grandfather was out of the house um, when she was by herself just brought me to a place of trying to th envision myself having to leave my house, leave my country, leave my parents uh, at an early age, lose the people in my life that I loved, and then reestablish myself back in a country um, that was the enemy for, for many of the Russian people back in Germany. Today I received a letter from home. I read it and remembered everything, everything that is in the past. Why, it seems that not long ago I was with them, and now I am so far away. I sent a photo of Albert and Paul. I know my dear mother will start crying. My goodness, how I miss you all. Trying to dissolve or forget about what had taken place had to be a very difficult thing. And now trying to just regain stability, um, trying to keep your family together. I remember my father would often tell me that he didn't remember. This was 1948. My father was already eight or nine years old. But through the traumatization of going through all these things, going from country to country, um, living amongst all these people who had tragedies, um, it had to have an effect on everyone. And yet everyone had to put a smile on. As I looked at the photos, it, it, it looked like my grandmother was, was happy. But of course, there was many things that were probably under the surface that were brewing, her feelings, her emotions. July 28, 1946. We have arrived in the American zone in Germany. I won't let your memory a fall asleep. That we hate I want most my warm all. feelings and sweet now words to reach you to in the darkness of where you them. are now. July 14, I am so far from your ashes, but my feelings are always with you. It taught me a lot about life, and it taught me how to endure, and it taught me how to look at, appreciate things in a different perspective. Um, although I was raised in, in, a, in a culture where everything was given and, and at, at our disposal, it made me feel, um, by looking at my grandmother's photos and by hearing about her life, how difficult life was and how she appreciated the, the small things. From 1947 to 1951, they would spend their lives in and out of displaced persons camps until January of 1951, when they were sponsored to come to New York, where Noel had family. Yes. The hour of good fortune has arrived. They have notified us that we will be traveling to America. My heart is afraid of the unknown. I am not afraid of anything that will be good for us, but I am afraid to be going further and further from Europe, from my family. This is a beautiful picture because everything is calm. But when we were there, it was a terror, nightmare. What, what were the, way, the waves you said were like mountains then? They were mountains. They were, this is the boat that looked like a toy. Like a toy bouncing back and forth. So everybody was sick who was in the boat. The refugees, I don't know about the uh, crew, but uh, the ref, all refugees. And what happened when you said you came to New York? You, you came through which way? Just point to where you came through. Well, we came through here. We came through, at that time you didn't have uh, Verrazano Bridge. But from that, that end, traveling right by Brooklyn, uh, what's that island over there, Adam? Governor's Island? The Governor's Island. We passed the Governor's Island. We entered Manhattan, tip of Manhattan. On the left side, this was at night. All you saw was lights. And uh, that's what I remember. Yes, one can see the ocean. Grayish, tumultuous waves that are taking me away from Europe from that which is most dear on earth, from one's family and friends. Cry, my soul. Cry, pour out your tears, for there is no one to say a dear word to you. Farewell. 
and no one will squeeze our hand upon our departure. All are far away from us. Only the heart of a mother will hurt all the more because the maternal instincts live on. How hard and bitter it is. We were talking when we come back, when we come to America, that we're going to have chicken soup. At last, our hard ocean journey has come to an end. Eleven days in the tumultuous sea. It is difficult to turn in towards how much suffering and horror a human being has been through. The one who has never taken a trip across the ocean can't imagine how difficult it is. Thank God we arrived, and everybody is alive. It seems beautiful around here, but it's very stuffy because of smoke from factories. Time will show what our new life will be like. As the remnants of my divorce wore on, a lack of closure, communication, isolation from my kids, I was drawn to the subject of World War II and the soldiers going to war. Something in the letters soldiers were writing home about emanated the pain I felt away from my kids. My grandmother was always there for me. The photos, the stories, my interest. It helped me escape my reality. It would have been comforting to share my life now, but my grandmother was long gone. All that was left now was tucked away in a box in my mother's and father's basement. Who can overlook all the history, all the information that she shared? My grandmother was waiting for someone to take notice, to remember, not to forget. I just couldn't. As I went through the documents, all the letters, the diaries, and the certain photos, I thought of her tears and her heartache. Each photo was labeled for my father to know, to recognize, to remember who everyone was. But he had no interest. Why? I couldn't feel anything more painful than my children forgetting me. So mom was talking to me when I was young. I didn't understand it and I shut it off from my mind. I shut, I shut it off completely. That's why I never discussed anything with her. I remember that. She made me cry all the time. Dear friend, I continue to love you as before. Where are you, my beloved? Respond. My dear friend, I love you with all my heart, my gentle friend. I have not the strength to forget you. Your poems, your words which you wrote and sang to me ring in my ears. Your gentle voice, your far off gaze is before me everywhere. I treasure you above all. I cannot forget you. This was, you know, this was her other world that she was crying for. And I never saw him in, dressed up as a, a ski patrol. But you saw the, oh, so you just saw the military picture. Did you ever see a ski patrol? No. That's what I'm trying to say. No, no, no. I only knew because I found he out. Ne she never said he was in ski she, patrol. She wouldn't know he's in a ski patrol. How she would, what? How would she know that he's in a ski patrol? What are you talking about? She didn't, he didn't tell her in the, in the letters? No, it's a secret mission. Oh, okay. So that's... Yeah, he okay. Couldn't, he couldn't do that. I, I, she didn't know that? I don't think so. I didn't know that. I didn't understand why she was living with a man and crying over this person that she loved so much. How could she love that man if, if she could marry this man, which is my father, not the biological, my stepfather. That's, that's, that's what confused me. I was, I, I was always logical, but that didn't make sense to me. Why, why was it so important to her? Where are you? Where are your bright lips? When will I see you again? Yes, when? When will I hug you tightly and kiss you, my darling? I remain behind as your wife with a six-month-old son. My dear, I will die for you. There is no one to whom I can express my sadness. I'm alone. Alone, do you hear? Alone. Where are you? What will you say to me? Has your heart cooled toward me? I know it hasn't. You love me the same as before, but you do not see me, and you cannot tell me. I know you. 
I know from your letters how much you love me, but our separated life is destroying all that. Do you feel in your heart the murmur of tender love? When we were so young and happy, you a 20-year-old young fellow, and I was 17. Where are those years? He's got the same serious expression as a soldier would. Yeah. They were married in 1938, yeah. So they had me probably soon after. Probably had me soon after. <laughs> Does it bring memories? No. So, but now, now you can look at these pictures differently? When you look at them, do you feel of what, course. Do you, what do you feel now? When you of look course at I look at them, how I look at them. I look. I look at them when they uh, when they got married. They were happy. <laughs> and then the life is broken. I feel bad for my mother. I feel no. I suffered. <laughs> Enough for it, Adam. Today is Thursday. We arrived to our new apartment, 155 South 2nd Street, Brooklyn. While it is so good to have our apartment, we are bored and we don't know the reason why. Now we are isolated from other people. There are only four walls around us. We have nobody to talk with. Oh my God, it's so difficult to remember everything, everything that happened before we crossed the ocean. best. She was a good mother, good grandmother. She was, she was lonely. Papa was always selling in the road, all he was doing. And she just said, ask the kids, Paul and me. And that's all she had. So she says, where am I going? Where will I be? You know, she, didn't, she thought of that, I'm sure. Back at, at what I went through, they were they were wonderful years for me. I was a kid, even though from country to country, from born on trains, and, and I I enjoyed it. I always said that I, I loved Germany. I had fun, but the, the reality is that we didn't have a normal life. We were like gypsies, without a home. We finally we came to America, and this this is this is my home. People think I'm extremely happy with such life, having a husband and two kids. God, if you exist, only you can see everything. I don't have a real life. Fifteen years passed since the day when I married. I was young, fresh, rosy, and beautiful. I wish humanity not to know such grief as we did and our future generations not to have such hard times. I am having a hard time, but what should I do? I have accepted my fate. I was patient and went through everything. Life goes on. My youth is irretrievably in the past. I felt that if I could find my grandfather and bring him back into the family, it was possible that one day I could bring my children back to me. You see, I felt it was my responsibility to keep the past alive so that I knew where I was headed. He was there when he was young. He needed <laughs> And he feels in his heart 
that he had to do this. I know Hitler had a decree against the political offices that any German soldier that found the political officer was supposed to execute them on the spot. Um, and I feared that my grandfather might have been one of these soldiers that had died at the very beginning of the war. And I felt that there may not be a grave or a place where he could be found, that he'd be in the woods somewhere. But one day as I opened up my email, I came across one of the emails from my friend Andre, who had a connection to the archives. It was the Memorial for Russian Veterans. And I came across the name of my grandfather and the grave site of where he was. He was located in, in one of the mass graves in Karmanovo, uh, Russia, in the Smolensk region, which is about three hours west of Moscow. Um, luckily, I made friends with people on the internet that when I arrived in Russia, they were able to assist me and bring me to the gravesite. It was almost a, it was a scary feeling to know that I would be going to a place that was once not off limits to Americans, but more so a place that held such a history for my family. And now I was trying to uncover this past. Um, my friend Andre had set up an appointment with a friend of his that was able to take me by car probably on the road that many of the soldiers took back in 1942 uh, to defend the Russia against the German invasion. And traveling along this road, I brought, brought back the memory of thinking of what the soldiers saw out there, tanks, caravans marching forward to defend their land uh, against an invader. Now here I was, some 70 years later, driving with a car, listening to music, and looking to find my grandfather's grave. After visiting uh, Karmanovo, I took a flight to Siktivka, which was about 800 miles north of Moscow in the Komi Republic. I had always heard of Komi from my grandmother that she was a Komi Zurian person. One of the villages we visited, Majadur, which was the place my grandmother and my grandfather lived, and my grandfather was a school teacher in this village. My grandmother was a midwife. Um, walking through the, 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 the village itself, uh, there was a woman on the bus who got off the bus because she saw a commotion going on by the places that I was walking. And she happened to be the school librarian who was also the local historian who knew all about the veterans that were served in the war, the people who lived in the village. She had pictures of my grandfather's name on a war memorial. She knew the house that my grandmother and grandfather lived specifically. She was able to visit the, the students of my grandfather. There were more than one. Some of them would talk about visiting, seeing my grandmother cry and tearing her hair out of her head when she got the news that my grandfather was killed in the war. Вот это дом, где был медпункт в тридцать седьмом году. Ah, this is a medical uh, hospital. It was in 1932. It was just a whole interesting thing to meet this woman. She eventually would get me into contact with one of my grandfather's students who came to her house and we sat down and we spoke in her living room. Он был высокий, худой, а Николай Викентьевич приехал. Николай Викентьевич из Кам, Он приехал, но тогда еще было такое ученик, ученицы это одни, а учителя это были другие. С нами они только на уроках, а он оказался очень демократичным. И с нами начал играть, сами, скажем. Полено такое, а через полено до доска и прыгали. И сразу его полюбили все. Ну, очень похоже. Год, год. Школа? Это школа, да? Я там училась. Это школа моего грандфолда тоже. Я там училась тоже. И он там преподавал. We eventually went outside and she served us food with eggs and fresh eggs from the, from the, from the chickens and we started to dance and she started to play a famous uh, Komi song called Shondiban. Channel pack. <laughs> 
And it was just a cultural feeling that brought me back to my childhood when my grandmother would play Russian songs from, from, from her youth, songs from the war. Um, it, was just a, it was just a warm feeling to be able to be in the exact place where my grandmother would tell me these stories and write her diaries and now to actually be with there with my, my body and to just experience the whole, um, the whole history. It was, it was beautiful for me. <laughs> Through the archives, I was able to find my grandfather, but also I was able to find the family of my grandfather. My grandmother once showed me a photo of a picture of my grandfather's sister. Her name was Alexandra. I placed that photo on the internet and I put it on a, a site for missing family members of Russian soldiers and to try to reconnect with family. Um, I put that photo up and within weeks somebody contacted me from Russia and said they were the family of this person and they knew who the person was. It was wild to think that here I could put a photo up and, and somebody would be able to contact me, that somebody would even recognize the person and that happened to be my grandfather's sister. Um, within Within a few days, I got an email back from a family member named Irena, and she wrote me and told me that she was the family of, of my grandfather, the Turopovs from Koigorodok. Over 40 years have passed, so far removed from my grandmother's kitchen table, but now, closer than ever, a boy from Brooklyn standing in the native land of my ancestors. All the stories and photos now alive in front of me, Sensing the heartache as vast as the lands that separated her from her family. Her beloved husband lost in war. A land that stood still in time, almost giving me the opportunity to retrace the lost memories. How my life's path of isolation, conflict, at home, the setbacks in my adult life with my own children, would send me on this path to seek my grandfather and awaken a distant memory. Bringing him back to his place in the family, how my grandmother tried with my father to no avail, but how she succeeded with me. I remember looking through my grandmother's photo albums, and I remember seeing the pictures of their graves and actually the, the bodies being laid out outside the houses. Um, and I knew the significance of remembering through my grandmother. I remember going with her to my grandfather's grave in, in Long Island, or my uncle's grave in Long Island, and my grandmother bringing food and having a picnic at the gravesite almost to commemorate the, the soul of the person who passed on, to bring them back and to feed their soul with food and to enjoy with them. And so I knew that death was a significant part of my Russian culture, my Russian ancestry. And I remember when I was in Russia and in Siktiv Kar and being at the gravesite of my great-grandparents, my grandfather Alexeyev and my great-grandmother Anastasia, it was a significant moment for me to be there because I knew how much my grandmother was unable to attend or be at that place after my, her parents passed away. But I now had the opportunity to, to stand beside the grave and to just pay my respects to them. I knew that, or at least I, in my heart, I knew that they were watching over me and knew that, that I, would, I was honoring their soul. My dearest, it is now seven years that you have been rotting in the ground. And where? In what parts? I don't even know where your grave is. I cannot bring fresh flowers and my bitter tears to your graveside. I cannot cry my heart out at your graveside at the piece of earth that covered you forever. My goodness, you were so young. You shone with beauty. You were taken away in the best years of your life. My dear, why is it so difficult for me without you? Why can't I forget you, not even for a second? You no, know, 
order for somebody to be remembered, do we really have to write a book, be an actor, be famous, to have a monument named after us? Isn't it simple enough to just have a history? My grandfather was a school teacher. He was sent off to war at 25. He never returned. I just felt it sad that he lost his name, he lost his life, he lost his child, he lost his place in the family. God rest your soul. Your grave is probably grassed and there isn't a path to you. But if one could gather all my tears, which I have been crying during these years, one could get a river which would flow to you. I'm very proud that you're doing this, that you found where he was buried, that he put both sides of the family, my mother's family and my father's biological family together. That was important. On a global level, can conflicts between countries really hold back the feelings of the heart? Not only was I able to bring my grandfather back into his family, but also to bring two cultures together for a moment in time. Although far apart in distance and ideology, but willing and open to exchange sentiments of history and understanding the human experience. Many policies created by governments shatter the opportunity for people to understand one another. Certainly no greater difference than that between Russia and America. However, when we operate from our hearts rather than our head, we are connected universally. Great things are possible. At least for a moment, we'd be able to share the commonalities of the human spirit, which has the potential to break the barriers of isolation. So many years passed already when you're going to hear this record. And always remember, I always with you, and I always will be with you rest of your life.